Since we last saw each other, I spent a week in New Haven. It was a treat to be back at the Episcopal Seminary at Yale exactly 20 years after I graduated. What a luxury to be immersed in intellectual and spiritual engagement with some of the same professors who taught me there in the early 2000s. Spending time getting to know the current dean, Andrew McGowan, and more than 50 other brilliant clergy from around the world, our inaugural cohort gathered in person to begin a six-month pilgrimage for transforming ministry in Yale Berkeley's Leaders' Way program. Those gathered had typically served in ordained ministry for at least 10 years and came from all around the Anglican Communion. Our chaplain for the week was the retired dean of Canterbury Cathedral, Robert Willis, who became famous during the pandemic for his daily prayer services from the garden on the Canterbury Close. Living back on campus at Yale, spending time in classrooms, exploring the campuses of Benjamin Franklin and Polly Murray Colleges, as well as the Yale Art Museum and the Psy Center for Innovative Thinking, immersed in conversation with colleagues all eager to share the joys and the challenges of navigating the past decade or so in the church, is among the greatest privileges of my life so far. Taking time apart together to recall what called us to serve in the first place, beginning to build new relationships, listening to God together, asking ourselves how we are being called to share the gospel with the world, doing critical work as God's people together, nourishes us as leaders of God's people in the world. Listening to God is the work of the community of faith. Helping one another listen to and stay close to God is what God's children are called to do together. Spending time with such an extraordinary group of leaders gave me immense hope for the church. The way ahead may be unclear for God's people on earth, but the Holy Spirit is alive and active, as is the good news that we are all called to share. And that, my friends, is the message we hear in Scripture today. When we trust that God keeps God's promises and continue to show up for God, Things have a way of working out. And God has high expectations of God's people and the way we order our lives. Following God means putting God first above everything else. It means rising above fear to act with courage. And this is the expectation undergirding both passages from Scripture that we read together today. Today's short excerpt from Matthew's Gospel immediately follows last week's challenging passage in which Jesus speaks of coming not to bring peace but a sword. In Jesus' account, the cost of discipleship <clears throat> of the cost of discipleship, Jesus remains clear that putting God above all else means being willing to die, even being willing to challenge one's own flesh and blood to stay true to the gospel. Putting God first is an organizing principle of our life as God's people. And this truth grounds today's challenging passage from Genesis as well. Remember, Abraham and Sarah are raising their miracle child, Isaac. The child they gave the name Laughter. 
because both Abraham and Sarah laughed to imagine they'd be able to have a child when they were in their 90s. Isaac is the one through whom God promised, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. It is through Isaac Abraham's descendants will be more numerous than the stars. This is what God promised long before we arrive at the terrifying scene of today's lesson when God tests Abraham. Now it's easy to get distracted and bogged down reading this passage through our 21st century lens. Modern sensibilities take child abuse and human sacrifice seriously. And scholars examine the visceral reaction the reading of this passage brings forth in grim detail. Yet, to dismiss the message in taking offense at God's harsh tactics, we miss the point. God tests Abraham's faith, and Abraham passes the test. Abraham can do so because he trusts God's promise. As Yale Berkeley Dean Andrew McGowan observes quite eloquently, the point of the story, rather than the sacrifice Abraham avoids, is the promise God makes. Abraham trusts God's promise so completely that he is able to inhabit the tension of extreme contradiction of being asked to take a knife to his beloved son. He is able to inhabit the tension of that contradiction long enough to allow God to provide as he trusts God will. It's something like an extreme trust fall. Abraham knows God will provide because God must. Abraham trusts God because Abraham must. God is faithful and God expects us to be faithful too. God expects undivided loyalty. And as we read earlier in Genesis in the 15th chapter, as well as in summaries of this story in Paul's letter to the Romans and to the Galatians, as well as in the letter to the Hebrews, Abraham trusts God, and God reckons Abraham's trust as righteousness. Putting God first requires Abraham to walk toward that altar with his treasured son, trusting that while the resolution remains unclear, God will provide. Putting God first demands summoning courage, rising above fear, showing God complete confidence in promises made, trusting in the relationship previously established, transcending fear of opposition and being faithful to the call of serving as messengers of God's good news is the work of the disciple. And Jesus expects as much of his disciples in this 10th chapter of Matthew we have been reading for the last few weeks. Mortal danger, division among family members, being willing to leave everything to follow God and keep God first in one's list of priorities, all part of the cost of discipleship. Regardless of how hard it may be to follow, when we trust the promises God has made to God's people, the Lord provides for what we need. 
traveling light, receiving hospitality, is the way Jesus instructs his disciples to proceed. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. The one who receives God's messenger receives God himself. Now the word in Greek that we translate receive or welcome, the Greek word dekomai, has multiple meanings. In fact, I found five that all make sense to this context. I'm going to share them. The first, to receive. To receive something offered or transmitted by another. The second, to take something in hand, to grasp. The third, to be receptive of someone, to receive, to welcome. We hear Jesus use this word when he talks about welcoming the little children. The fourth, to overcome obstacles in being receptive, to put up with, to tolerate. And the fifth, to indicate approval or conviction by accepting. All five of these meanings are implicit in spiritual hospitality. In last week's gospel lesson, Jesus observes how a disciple is no greater than the teacher, a slave no greater than a master. In the work of tending souls, all are equally valued in God's eyes. We are called to receive one another with this truth in mind. Hospitality then, hospitality of spirit is the ground of our lives as a community of faith. There is nothing more important than our belonging to God. No country club, no gym membership, no social clique, no rock band or sports team or college or university or seminary or other professional affiliation, no relative, no ethnic background, no other association ranks us above or below one another in this radically hospitable family of God. In God's eyes, we're all equal. And any time we dare rank or subordinate such affiliations, such affiliations to our worship of God, we make idols of the very gifts God has given us to tend with love and gratitude. It is in this context God expects us to receive and welcome one another as fellows on a journey. There's no hierarchy of souls. God abides in all and through all. As one of my favorite seminary professors said, and I heard her voice all week long, God is very, 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 very big. We are very small. The founders of this great country we inhabit established these United States with the express intent that all be treated equally. Did they succeed fully? Of course not. They set out on a journey They initiated a beautiful project, a vision of freedom upon which every one of us improves as we practice our faith. As God's people, we belong to God. As we inhabit this glorious planet that God made, we live embodied souls, called to realize our full potential as human beings, divinely implanted. 
called to live with integrity as God's children, called to respect the dignity of every human being, called to receive one another, fellow pilgrims on the way, imperfect and broken, on, on our way to something far more wonderful than we can imagine called to gather and break bread with one another, knowing that the more we do, the more filled we become with the healing power of God's love that we are called to share with the world. We make our way through this world and beyond in the company of the communion of saints, working with all our might to see heaven made manifest on earth. As we do, we keep ready to receive, to welcome, to embrace with courage what comes our way. Did you notice how Abraham responded when God called? Here I am. Did you notice how Abraham responded when Isaac called? Here I am. Did you notice how Abraham responded when the angel called? Here I am. The response of faith answers, here I am, trusting that the Lord will provide.